So I guess the first question I want to ask is one I know is very common because it affected me and my decision making. Um, but is it safe for a first time mum to have a home birth? Yes, um, in my experience, I can talk about my experience. Yes, it is. Um, I can't give you the figures offhand, but I have been with, you know, over 25 years with hundreds and hundreds of women who have had their babies at home. And uh, I was actually quite um, overjoyed by the way I was learning by being with and beside women. Uh, many years ago at a conference in uh, New South Wales, the beautiful um, uh, Maggie Lecky Thompson led me to think that maybe home birthing would be an option for me to consider. And of course, I was in charge of a hosp public hospital labour ward then. And well, then it wasn't probably the right time. And then the beautiful Caroline Flint from the UK was there too. And uh, and I've had a lot to do with Caroline over the years who, who gave us really good grounding, same as Maggie during her time, and also um, Beverly Beach from the uh, um, the Association of Radical Midwives, which started in the UK, and then my dear now um, deceased colleague, Chris Shanahan, and I started with the help of Caroline Flint, uh, the Association of Radical Midwives in Melbourne, first time ever in Australia, and now it's, it's actually moved through Australia, so there's a there's a group here in Brisbane and, and they're, uh, you know, it's all connected. So it's about um, the midwives speaking out again, midwives being there again, uh, women knowing that they can have a midwife if they choose to. They can have a midwife of their own, private midwife, or they can have a group practice midwife. They can give birth in various places. Uh, the birth centres were closed down here very sadly, again, by political decision making, all that sort of thing that went on. But hopefully those things will begin to occur because what happened in a money saving event through politics, they decided to move all women into illness hospitals. And so, you know, the very few women then that reduced the, the, the number of women birthing at home it was a whole big disaster of women being herded into a system um, women being rushed through the system and then of course then the intervention rate increasing phenomenally and all the things that are done to women and their bodies that is not done at home but also practiced safely so that we carry with us home a small kit which is equivalent to a small labor ward kit that you would have in the room with you we can put drips up we can look after bleeding we can you know speak with the paramedics we can transfer to a hospital, except now there's restrictions about which hospital you can go to. All of that sort of thing is, is coming again, more restriction one after the other. I guess um, we're very fortunate in the UK because we still have the birthing suites. But one thing I know I've learned from you is that actually it always depends on where you're based in the world, um, mm. the policies, the laws that are based in that country. And you've yeah. taught us that every single birth is unique. So irrelevant whether it's your first, second, third or eighth mm. birth, each will mm -hmm. be unique in their own way anyway. Would yeah. you agree? Yes, and if you're practising responsibly and you're accountable for your actions, you're providing a duty of care, which is expected. The women know their rights. They know the, 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 right, um, the, the, right, the legal rights for consent and they have the right to, you know, that. And, the, and the, then the uh, senior medical uh, personnel will make decisions in, in case of an urgency or urgent or emergency situation. But, you know, with a healthy mother and a baby at GAR 7 or more, then no intervention at that stage, at any stage, unless it's absolutely necessary. But what happens, they start off with one and then the cascading intervention starts. And that's clear in the, in the latest research. There's uh, recent research out that telling us that there's recent research out about the continuous fecal monitoring has increased the cesarean section rate. There's a whole lot of factors mm -hmm. where... Uh, the biological function of the woman's body and her unique and her instinctive knowledge is impeded by the use of all of these technical things that that change her brain waves, that change her biorhythmical function. Yeah. And unless we speak up, it's going to continue. So we have to be strong and speak up. And, and our role from my midwifery perspective is that we are with 
and beside women. We do not stand over them. We do not dominate them. We move with them in their rhythm, not our rhythm. We talk with them gently and quietly in their rhythm, not our rhythm. We do not give orders and instructions. We are gentle. We are calm. And we listen to the baby and we listen to the mother and we do our job and fulfil it to the highest possible quality that we can. Yeah, and I can confirm, and I know this is a fact, that all of our followers, the ones that have learned from you and become wise, we can all confirm that we feel 100% more confident to be advocates for ourselves, which is so important, not mm -hmm. only in birthing and breastfeeding, but in motherhood and being a woman as well. So, Robin, thank you so much for that. I know that I am definitely a, a more confident to say no <laughs> when yeah. I need to. And it's yeah. it's super important. And you've you've probably answered this um, just now, just touched on it. But just give us a little bit more information on how safe home birthing is. Is it safe to birth at home? Well, if you're practicing as a professional, as expected of the professional midwife, it should be. But of course, you know, we can't always pers um, predict what will happen, what's going to happen. And so we need to be experienced and we need to be prepared for those sorts of things. So what we carry with us is really important. Uh, how we go about our business is really important, but gentle. And also in a, in a, in a time when you do need help, you, generally we have a buddy midwife who's there with you, comes, comes and is there with you. We look after each other as well. And, and the women know that. Um, and the women choose who they want around them as well. So, and we need to remember that we are entering their home, that we are visitors in their home. We do not take over their home and everything about them in that home, but we do the very best to achieve what is expected of the reasonable midwife in the circumstances. And I think most of us that I know of anyway, do practice that way. And, and you know, I can talk about my own experience over many, many years. and you know, even helping a woman give birth to a stillborn, but stillborn little baby with me by her side, lower than she was, because we were on it, we were 33,000 feet in the air on an aircraft. Oh. So I, you know, I've done about four or five assisted um, nursing or, you know, episodes on a plane that's helped people. But yeah. that was one one that was very particular and the doctor there didn't know what to do. So he needed me more than I needed him at that stage. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me with your experience, but I'm not in the slightest. Yeah, but he did say if I needed, he'd help me put a drip in, but we didn't need that. She, <laughs> she was very so very what about if, if women, uh, many believe they can't be monitored at home. So how how am I safe if I can't be monitored electronically? Uh, yes, you can have a small a Doppler. Midwives carry a Doppler with them, but they carry a small handheld Doppler, and that little Doppler can be turned down so it's not loud, or it can be looked. The readout can be seen um, so that you can see the 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 range of the baby's heart rate because it does range. It's not the same all of the time, and so and also as the baby progresses with the mother through the labour, through her pelvis, negotiating, moulding the head, negotiating the, the angles and the different shapes that the little baby has to manoeuvre through, then ba baby's heart rates do change. It's how they recover that's important, you know. So we're listening to those things with the mother's consent. And, of course, she wants to hear her baby's heart rate too, but as long as we don't have it thumping loud, it's about being discreet and, and, and giving her the best opportunity for the quiet time that she needs and the space that she needs as well. Well, in her own home, she can choose where she is. It doesn't matter, you know. That's so true. Oh, um, you speak about yeah. quiet and how important that is and yeah. why home birthing, that's a huge benefit. Um, I, I laboured for seven hours at home on my birthing ball in a dark corner, which is something you always talk about. And yes. I felt less pain and I felt so much more in control and calm. As yes. soon as I went to the hospital, which I was um, highly encouraged to do by professionals, family, friends, because it was my first baby. Um, yeah. And I really regret that, although I was fortunate enough to have a birthing sweet birth in the water, unmedicated, unmonitored. So I, I did have control, but there was a huge, a dramatic change in how I felt the moment I walked through those hospital doors mm. and I had all those beeping sounds and I could hear other women and 
it's very clinical, isn't it? I completely mm -hmm. see where you're coming yeah, from. It's not, not the ideal place for a woman who forever has given birth quietly in a place that she feels safe in. Um, you know, we do have to be wise. We do have to be um, on the alert because, you know, things do indicate to us that there may be something that we need to deal with. And, and it depends, you know, what that might be at any one point in time, how we deal with that. So there's no, I, I mean, I can't give you an absolute, but we do deal with things at home and we, we can put an intravenous up, we can resuscitate a baby, we can, you know, work with the mother and whatever her needs are. If she's bleeding, we can work with ways of dealing with that. So we're so prepared um, for emergency situations. That's something that women, lots of women have asked us. And what if there's an emergency? You're prepared, you're, you're trained as midwives, you're trained, right? Well, we're educated. Plumbers are educated. trained. Electricians are trained. <laughs> That's very true. And that will be a vocabulary <laughs> that will learn to change. Educated. Yeah. Very we educated. We are an educated profession. We are a profession in our own right. We do not um, conform to medical control. Uh, we do do complementary discussion and complementary work with our medical colleagues. And I've had many brilliant medical colleagues over my career absolutely delightful to be able to be a partnership with with the woman and she's not left out at any stage I find that quite lacking in the women's stories the stories that are women are giving back to me now uh, there appears to be a real void in in what's happening with women even more so in the institution now than ever so um, I think that women uh, they will know whether they want to, to be at home or whether they don't want to be at home. Labouring at home is really good. It depends how far you have to travel because you don't really want to have your baby on the road in the way on the no, way in. Exactly. Although that does happen because they close down birth centres and they close down, you know, birthing places. So that meant that more and more women were having babies on the side of the road. But we we don't really want women to do that. Um, it was it's not the best. Uh, situation unless it's you know by pure chance that it's a rapid delivery and a, a rapid birth and she's just the baby's descending quickly but you know sometimes then you're better to stay at home and hopefully someone can come but that's not always the way unless it's planned so again you know there's there's a whole lot of factors around it that um, that change for each unique woman what might be her plan or alternatively gives her a plan that she didn't expect too. Yes. So that uh, we've had well. lots of uh, incredible and uh, really inspiring um, free birth stories um, through the Thompson Meth and community um, where dads or, or mums or family members have delivered the babies where it's happened so quickly, as you say. Can and I they're really beautiful stories. Stories. Can I stop that at that point? We oh. do not deliver babies. Women give birth to babies. <laughs> it's their baby. It's their body. It's their birth. The only time we assist a woman with a delivery is when it's necessary. But we don't deliver babies. We actually give that. that glory back to the mother. It's hers. <laughs> I am. Um, I, I I follow a um, a midwife, <laughs> a UK midwife, who I'd love to introduce you to, Robin. And I saw uh, her comment that the other day, a lady had given birth on a plane, and the news, the press were saying that they had delivered the baby, and they were passing the baby around, showcasing for photos, and she was furious oh, no. about it. That's yeah. one of my most horror scenes is to see that happen when a mother. When a baby is taken off a mother, that is not right. It is absolutely wrong. That is her baby, unless she chooses for someone to have her baby. But again, that the mammal baby should be with the mother from the moment of birth with an APGAR of seven or more. That's the safest. Everything is right about the sensory skills for that baby. Should not be passed around. That's just not the way it goes. And I love, I love I, your passing <laughs> Not in my experience anyway. <laughs> no, I think um, I think it's about time we, we know this as women. We don't know this. We don't know that it's okay to keep baby with us. Um, yeah. I think that it's, you know, I've said before, the Thompson Method isn't just a method, it's a movement. And that's because of your passion and your hard work, Dr. Robin. So um, I hope that you empower women to say no and to keep their babies close. We're mammals, as you say. So why wouldn't we want to? So you've, you've touched upon it lightly. Tell, tell me, Robin, what if, what if I change my mind? I'm at home. 
I'm birthing. What if I change my mind and I don't I don't want to be at home anymore? That's okay because we have well we if we're planning well with the woman and we're listening to what she's saying and if she does change her mind we have a backup system available and ready and for me in my day that was very easy very well respected no hassles no restrictions whatsoever welcome we were welcomed and um and so and once you got there you're included you were not cut off which was brilliant because you know, I've been with the woman for however long, why would they want to cut me off? You know, it's not, it's inclusive. It's about complementary services. So um, I was very lucky to have that, that sort of thing available, but I'm not sure that that's working as well now. Mm -hmm. And uh, for a lot of factors, but I do believe that we need to rethink, we need to re- um, establish what, how we're thinking and what are the benefits for a, a woman? What are her benefits, not our benefits? Absolutely. What and are benefits for her? I think that benefits is something that we're miseducated about most of the time, something that we don't ask. I know that I definitely could have asked more questions as to why can't I birth at home? Why? Is there a valid reason? Why do you want to give me a membrane sweep? Why? 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 That's so important now. And I've learned that from your education and and whilst we're on the topic of being educated um many of you may not know that dr robin has an online course which covers everything here uh, everything that dr robin has said today and much more is included and it's the best way to prepare for breastfeeding birthing and feeling empowered and there's birth and breastfeeding plan templates there as well which will be really helpful to guide you in creating your own unique birth and breastfeeding plan and there's a wonderful community. And if, if you want to know more, then let us know. But today we are we're giving away something very special. And that is a, a special bonus call with Dr. Robin herself and midwife Rachel, who's a very close colleague of Dr. Robin and, and a big part of the Thompson Method community. I'm sure you'll agree, Robin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the group pre-birth video call um, is an opportunity for you to gain if you purchase today. And if you want that, then just comment hashtag baby bump below. Or if you want to know more, let us know. Um, I know that it, I wouldn't be still breastfeeding now at almost 15 months without your education, Dr. Robin, even beyond those newborn and early days, teething, introducing solids. Um, there's so much more to it. And I know that there is a, a huge community of women, thousands of us, I was just so grateful to have the, the breastfeeding journey of our dreams, really. It's interesting because I'm actually receiving some feedback from women where they're breastfeeding now still at two and a half years. So, you know, it's crept up uh, over the time that we've been working this way. So hopefully, or we've been not working, we're actually talking and we're, we're providing unique information for each woman, but listening to her, what her needs are. And, and again, we do that with consent. We do that with a detailed history. Uh, and, and Rachel and I, um, and, and previously Julie, we actually, um, you know, have that one-on-one -on -one with women, uh, which I think the time is important. You know, it's one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> with the time that's, you know, roughly it's a time that's required for the average time a woman needs to mm -hmm to breastfeed and to talk with you and to you know be able to understand where she's at in her unique situation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, again there's no rules from my point of view because you know, i can't in my wildest dreams can't apply rules to women that's mm -hmm. not fair but what i do is give them the information because instinctively they know always and most of the time they are rarely ever wrong they just need the encouragement if we have the time to listen and look at them with them together with their consent as a unique person a unique a unique and especially with breastfeeding a unique breast unique nipple unique shape unique size all the variations body length you know um all the way the babies are holding so today, for example, I did a breastfeed with a mum not so long ago before we started. Finished, finished. I mean, then. So um, busy you are. Yeah, <laughs> from uh, New South Wales, and she had been having her baby forced to her breast, and today she breastfed both breasts. Her doing it very gently, cradling her baby, and and feeding. You know, there's still a little way to go because she has 
painful trauma, but she fed very well. So I keep hoping that, you know, the more that, that we share and the more that how we work together or being together with these things, it will pass on and more women will be, and, and especially if it's if it's going through the university as well, you know. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and that's our aim. Our aim is to share Dr. Robin's mm. education with as many women across the world. We have such a worldwide community. We're so we're yeah. so privileged in that sense to, yeah. to have access to Dr. Robin's education. Mm. So yeah, if, if you want the access to today's show notes, oh. let us know. Comment hashtag home birth today and, and, and you'll have access to that and um, hashtag baby bump for more information and the bonus on Dr. Robin's online program. So Robin, here are some more fun questions about home birth. Um, I don't uh, this, know this one, this one before, before, fun questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not necessarily fun. I guess it leads us away from the emergency feeling of home birth. Mm -hmm. A lot of women um, associate home birth with danger, emergency and failure, I suppose. that's That's been my um, learning of the situation since researching home birth a lot of women are scared they're petrified about not having medical professionals from a hospital around them and they're uneducated and what they can do with their bodies and with the help working alongside a professional midwife or doula so hopefully they'll see this today and feel more empowered in making their choices but robin what about after birth care Women want to know if it's the same. What happens? Does the midwife disappear as soon as they've given birth? What about after birth care for themselves? Immediately and we're talking baby? about after birth often refers to the placenta. So if we talk about, are you talking about the placenta or are you talking about the postpartum time? Or the I think um, generally I, I'm referring to the placenta birth and um, possible vaccinations the baby will have and other medical interventions. And of course, the first breastfeed, those few hours after birth. Tell us about okay, that. so that immediate time. So I, I work with women on the basis that um, it's how that how their birth has been, how they feel, but if possible, not to separate from your baby. That's that's the the probably one of my prime. The first three golden hours are a time where the mother has and the baby have time together when the baby's APGAR score is seven or above. Mm -hmm. The baby is with the mother where it should be. It's just come from the mother's uterus. It should be with her right here, not with someone else. And also that the uh, routine procedures can wait. They are not urgent and they are not emergency things. They are for ticking boxes to say they have been done. So I think ticking boxes needs to be reconsidered and the respect given back to the women that, you know, this is their time, not our time. And those sorts of things, if necessary, can be done when it's appropriate and when the mother agrees. As far as vaccinations, you're talking about hep B and that's the vaccination. Are you talking about vitamin K? I'm talking about both. That's, yes, exactly okay. what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So with, with those, either of those do not need to be given immediately unless there's a known history that might... Um, uh, need consideration in relation to either one of those. So someone who hasn't been quarantined has come to the country, there may be a reason to give it, to provide the little baby with that earlier. Uh, vitamin K, uh, in Japan they have a syrup, they don't actually inject babies and I think we can do that here too, we can use, but I'm not sure how we go about it now. We used to use the ampule and I would mix that with breast milk if it was necessary. Mm -hmm. Uh, express and help the mother with expressing some breast milk and mix it with that because the taste of the ampule in the baby's gut is not good yeah. um you know it's it's not the first thing the baby should have it's the colostrum the baby should be having it's so that's so useful, baby, Robin. this is so so educated educated for yeah. women watching it's really useful stuff yeah, so the little baby should be with its mother, locating the, the breast in its own good time. So, you know, people expect it to do this baby to do this within an hour. Some babies, depends whether they've had, mothers had opiates, those babies may be sleepy. It depends on the history. It depends on the story that's happened mm -hmm. previously. So you're going moment by moment. And then um, it's really important to not to rush it's, there's no need to rush that the mother needs time, the baby needs time for its little mm -hmm. sense of skills, for its small brain to 
create the coordination that's necessary to make its way to the breast and then they feed at their leisure not rapidly not hurried not shoved out of the room and yeah. tripped off down the corridor in a in a chair they yeah. have that piece of time it's very very important and the baby will feed frequently from both breasts under most circumstances not always and draw down the colostrum which prepares the newborn gut for the rest of its life the yeah. microbiomes that are coming through that colostrum into that little baby's digestive system is phenomenal so we need to always as much as possible encourage and make sure that we facilitate that that we don't yeah. and, and, and what would you say the benefits are to a home birth with breastfeeding you talk about calm and patience and allowing the mother and baby to lead in their own journey but what how does a how does a home birth encourage that well the mother takes most times depending on the the, the circumstances the mother takes her own baby we don't actually take her baby she holds her own baby she decides when she wants to separate the cord and the placenta she doesn't have set it depends on the circumstances entirely at the time and you know i won't go into all of that but it just you know that that's that's prepared that's preparation in pregnancy you talk about the wide variety of things and then you look at the in individual you know situation in the moment all of the time you're in the moment. And so you don't interfere with that mother and baby, but you keep a close eye on it. You want to know the colour of the baby's lips. The, you know, you see the baby pinking up once they take their first breath. The, the, the babies born particularly through water actually don't breathe straight away. They're very calm and they take that time that's required to take that first breast, breath, not breast, first breath <laughs> and uh, and it's really beautiful to see that and then some of the mothers who've had a baby before or several before say ah oh, baby's not crying no they're calm there's a difference so the transition through the water seems to be uh you know a, a beautiful way too and again it's not always perfect because you know i have had to help unravel a little baby who was wound in cord through the water coming up to mum and uh, and that was you know that worked beautifully again it's always in the moment yeah. so it's it's, uh, it's really nice to hear that actually because Jacob never cried um when I gave birth and I transitioned I birthed him and pulled him onto my chest and he never cried and I, I the first thing I said to the midwife was is he okay he's not crying and he, she said he's happy he's fine and then within 15 minutes he latched on and that was before Ines came in and told me I was doing it wrong and that was the uh, downfall of our journey um, but up until that point it was rather beautiful <laughs> um, yeah. so it's, it's interesting to know that they don't have to cry and if well, mothers, don't, like mothers don't do anything wrong it's the way we go about business that's wrong mm. we where our professional role is not to to make you feel like you're doing something wrong we can make suggestions that might help but we don't i don't believe we have any right to say anything that makes you feel you're doing something wrong yes. um, we guide you gently we advise you maybe sometimes if we feel it's really important but most of the time we make suggestions mm -hmm. and you know that that that's that's my way anyway and uh, i think thankful for the women that have you know given me the environments to be in that I could see this unfolding, like, you know, the first time a baby slept more than four hours, you know, <laughs> like, wow, what am I going to do? Well, a baby slept 10 hours. There, the there are always uh, lots of um, lots of questions from mum about sleep as well. And that's something we talk about quite regularly in the breastfeeding club and um, our paid community. And, Can I just um, talk about hydration? Because when, when the baby's born, if we mm -hmm. look, if we know the baby's been hiccuping, whether you're at home, wherever you are, having your baby on the side of the road, if you know your baby's been hiccuping, the baby hiccups each time it has a drink. So then, and then it settles down and then it hiccups again. So the what I'm looking at when I have that knowledge is the baby well hydrated. So if the baby's well hydrated at birth, then, uh, you know, I don't, I'm observing carefully, I'm doing the observations quietly, but not taking the baby, not touching the baby, mm -hmm. just observing, documenting what I see, and what I'm hearing and and all that sort of thing but not interfering with that beautiful mother and baby yeah. you know it, we're the only mammals except for the 
the mammals in the zoo that that anybody takes their baby off them on the you know we don't we we shouldn't be doing that anyway you'll see i'm passionate about that you are very <laughs> passionate about that and and your three golden hours um it, the thompson yeah. method is known for is i mean it's life-changing stuff dr robin it's life-changing and it's so empowering and so very true how important those three golden hours are so let mm -hmm. us know if you want to learn more about that we have a question dr robin from emily baxter let me see if we can share this uh, very good question actually and she says what about home birth after c-section um emily that's a unique situation it's a unique journey through your pregnancy it's a unique journey into your um your baby settling into your pelvis your your beginning your early labor your you know into established labor all of that is unique for you if you've had a previous cesarean section because what's important there is that if there's any signs of scar rupture or scar dehiscence dehiscence when it's opening the birds are having a bit of a competition with me can you hear them <laughs> <laughs> i can hear but it's okay we can hear you perfectly well don't panic yeah so um it it's not one answer so i have worked with many women who've had a previous cesarean section that have had a baby at home uh, and one was a 10 and a half pound baby and she did it beautifully but i'm not saying everybody can do that it has to be the mother prepares for it in pregnancy preferably that would be my suggestion. She prepares for it, she works towards it, but she keeps an open mind. And by keeping an open mind, and we're keeping an open mind with her, then the opportunities to do whatever she needs at any one point in time are there. And that's really, really important. Um, you know, not, not to have everybody believe that they can do this uh, because not everybody's the same. And so we can't give you a 100% guarantee. We cannot give you a 100% answer but we do our very best to help you achieve what your goals are. That's um, a very, I hope you found that helpful, Emily, but that's very, that's very yeah. useful for me as well. So Robin, um, we've got a couple of people asking about alternatives to pain relief and managing pain at home. Um, I think I know what you'll say here, but go ahead, mm -hmm. let us know what the alternatives are. Well, um, for me, most of the women were, had their own plan for their own, um, pain relief and most of that time would be in the water where they're buoyant and when they're buoyant that releases the tension of the of the muscles and the nerve endings and they can move more freely in the water because that's their own space that was one big thing and when when the woman immerses in the water you can just see her facial expression changing i have some beautiful photographs of that just beautiful photographs as the as as they feel the tension the shower is okay but also a midwives, uh, uh, I don't know in what parts of the world, but certainly here and I think the UK, we can do water injections and we have a couple of our uh, people here who've researched that and it's been researched, I know, in Europe. So um, it's it's clearly okay where um, we use water, sterile water injections over the the area that's most painful for the woman and then by just you know very very slightly under the skin not deep no needles deep very slightly create a little bubble and that sends nerve ending pain because it's a, a bubble between the skin and and the you know that very first early uh, layer and what it does then is blocks the pain way to the the, ga the gateway to the brain for the pain. That's that's and, so incredible. And, and yeah. of course, everyone is educated, midwives are educated to do that. Um, perhaps we'll have to chat in the future, Robin, about pain relief um, and pain management options. We can go into more detail on the huge. Yeah, because I'd like to say that if you can avoid epidural, then that protects your baby from the effects of the opioids. It also mm -hmm. protects you from the effects of the opioids. But if you do need um, you know, anaesthetics or for, for a very valid reason or you do need surgery, of course you need those drugs to help you through that time. So it's not about one thing fixes all. And there's people who have their own TENS machine. There's a whole range of things that can be done. There's massage and there's, you know, all, all, all the things that uh, each individual unique woman feels best with, what's right for her. Yeah. yeah, and you mentioned um, when you first started speaking about this, you mentioned having a plan 
and um, being open with it, but um, but trying to have an idea of what your wishes are going into yes. your birth, communicating yes. those, which is a great way to use your birth and breastfeeding plan. That's well, how no, you can I, communicate it. Yeah. I have a template that women can take what they feel, but it does have the the um, you know the the warnings and the information in it that you know these to be to be aware to you know not just to go out fully consider be considerate with what's happening so mm -hmm. it's very important that the template is not regarded as a birth plan for every mother because that's not right it's a template that explains a whole lot of things that helps the woman have the knowledge she goes with the knowledge and she works on her own unique situation and also she knows her rights so she can have discussions with people about things that she agrees with or things that she may not want right now or things that she doesn't agree with mm -hmm. and all of those things are not all of those i think it needs to be broadened but at the moment i don't have time to do that but i think there no, are things your template is it's wonderful i wish i had access to it when i was pregnant and i know so many women have have reaped the benefits from having that there as yes. guidance it's, it's it's really good stuff and if you'd like to know more about the template we can let you know um as robin said it's a great it's a great template and um, that explains and there's some videos there as well where dr robin explains um how you can break it down and implement it to make it unique for yourself mm. and your wishes and your situation so with the disclaimer the disclaimers are really important because we cannot guarantee every mother to be able to have the same thing it's just not possible so you know the, the disclaimers are to protect the mother and to ha have her think about that of course for sure um I have another question here robin which is a quite an interesting one um it says about um home birth at 42 kirsty says um it's my second pregnancy but the last was 11 years ago kirsty are you, are you i don't know whether you're planning a home birth at 42 um, uh, I have home birth with a mother at 45 um, and uh, she did very well, beautifully. So again, I can't give you an answer that would be for you, but if, it, depending on your circumstances, how you've progressed through your pregnancy uh, and you've already had a baby, so you are knowledgeable, you have that, you already have that, that stored information, which is very important. Doesn't mean to say it'll be the same, but it gives you more experience and that's that's the the real thing the experience that comes it may not be the same however yes by all means um you can uh you know you can make your choices as you go along it doesn't have to be rigid and i think that's the big problem is the the fear that we generate by coercion is rigidity it's not about expanding to see how things go for you that's the most important, I think, is working in the way that is, um, have I answered that properly? I, I would say so. I'm sure Kate yeah. would be very happy with that. It's interesting to know that you had uh, a mother who was 45 and I yeah. suppose that would be great reassurance. And there was no Kirsty. reason not for her not to. Um, and she progressed really well. She didn't need any medications. Um, you know, so I figure that we we put restrictions on women before they've even had a chance to see whether yeah. that's for them or not. You know, and of course, I've that experience that myself. So, yeah, we true. don't want to run into urgent and emergency situations. We want to predict what might be going to happen, and so we work with you on that basis. And mm. you know, I can say in my twenty five years, I never transferred by ambulance at all. Um, wow. I, yeah no because if we needed to go we would go either in their car or sometimes in my car depending on the circumstances and we would go and we would meet the team there and we would you know we would work in a very complimentary way and i'm missing that terribly when i'm hearing women's stories now mm -hmm. the stories that i'm hearing every day sometimes you know are very stressful for me to hear that because i don't believe it has to happen in the way it is. I think we can be much more uh, fluid in our approach, but careful. Yeah, that's, that's mm. so true. And it seems to be very controlled um, yeah. environment for women at the moment. Yeah. Um, so uh, one of our members have said that she has her birth full ready, um, it's blown up, she's ready for her big day. D is a birthing pool necessary, Robin? Do you need to, is there certain things you need to have at home? No. And there are some women who choose not to have a, a pool at home and that's okay, that's fine. 
I've had one woman who chose her spot on her beautiful back lawn with it all covered and doing what she needed to do. Another one on her back balcony, another one in front of her fire in the winter. So the warmth from radiating from the fire was, you know, of course protected, but that's where they chose to be. So you do not have to be in a pool if you don't want to be. You can, if you need to use water, you can, you can use the shower. You may not need to use anything. You might be walking. Some people dance. <laughs> Some people sing. Yeah. You know, it's it's different for everybody. And you know, a little bit of hip movement's great because that helps the baby negotiate through the pelvis. So, um, it, you know, there is a doctor in America that actually dances with the women. And I've yeah. seen him on mm. I've seen him on on the social media dancing with the women and they're progressing through labour. I think that's magic because it keeps our bodies in the mobile situation, but preferably not on a bed, preferably off a bed because that flattens the sacrum and the sacrum can't rise. And then the the diameters in or the room in that pelvis is reduced when you're laying flat on your back. And uh, yeah, if someone does need to yeah. give birth, you makes know. Sense reclining position or a layback position. Uh, it's called McRoberts and that can sometimes be very helpful, McRoberts position, but not with someone standing over you, directing you to push your baby out. No way. <laughs> it's what you do in your good time, but yeah. it's a and, um, I've, I've heard lots of stories about women. Sorry, Robin, I think we had a break in, in our signal there. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, so I, I, so I, I don't know you, if I heard the last few words. Would you like to repeat the last few things you said in case you have missed it? Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> what did I say? Can you hear me okay? McRoberts position. Oh, I talked about McRoberts position where it's a, it's, it is a position where you either That's sit it. and draw your legs right up or you lean back and draw your legs right up. McRoberts is a good position and it's worked very well over the centuries, so... Yeah, but it's it's not the only uprights better because you have gravity working with you and you have movement and, you know, but again, it might not be better for each individual unique woman either. So whatever's right for her. A lot of women, when they're really getting close, will start to make a sound, then the knees will bend. And I'll make another sound at the peak of a contraction and gradually it increases till they've gone to hands and knees on the floor. Many women will do that, and that's the way it just happens for them. Yeah, for sure. No rules. Mm -hmm. um, and would you say, Robin, that home births and um, water births, do you think that re reduces the risk of tearing? Is that possible? Not to my knowledge. Um, the, the, uh, the water, I think the, the water creates a, you know, a, a buoyancy effect. So I, I don't, again, if you're being instructed to, my belief and my experience is for the women who were instructed to push, the perineal muscle is, is stretched beyond its capacity too quick. So if you can do it gently in your own good time without someone instructing you, mm -hmm. that's where we get into your rhythm quietly, not loudly and not above you. We, we, we work with you very quietly to encourage you in your rhythm and that, that perineal muscle stretch, stretch, stretch. It stretches eight different ways. So it's a very flexible muscle. And I believe if I've got it right, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's, it's the only muscle in the body that goes that many directions. So it's not meant to be forced open. It's not meant to be ripped with hard pull with forceps because that soft tissue tears. And we try to avoid tears if we can. But by working with the woman in the moment, as long as the mother and baby is safe. If we need to do those things. If we... Wow. I, I think, uh, I mean, that's so... Yeah. I did not know that uh, it was meant to stretch that way. It's, it's incredible the, the changes our body goes through and the adaptations it makes to birth to bring the child into the world is, is incredible stuff. And, of course, so, that's not the big so This is the bit that's that I've been the, really excited about, Robin. I... <laughs> that's not the detail. Chelsea, of course. And I'm sure if um, any, any of our viewers want to add, I'm sure they will add to that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I can see you dropping in and out a little bit, yeah. 
All right, where are we up? I think um, we're both having a few signal issues, so sorry about that to our viewers. <laughs> so Robin, I've been really excited about this and I'm sure our viewers will will take pleasure in in and privilege in this. But would you would you be happy to share one of your birth home birth experiences oh, with us today? <laughs> I have plenty. Um let me think. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me tell you my first birth experience. Would that be okay? My Perhaps first home birth experience. Well. I was invited to a home birth with a colleague. Oh, a midwife of course it would be amazing with a midwife colleague and um our dear friend our gp was there too who was available if ever we needed him uh this mother ended up having six boys so i was there i think if i have it right for four because she'd had two before i came for the, the first time um she had a beautiful birth at home her two, two, two little boys were out with their nana and she was minding them, you know, in the rest of the house. Um, and she gave birth to this beautiful baby. And I was very anxious because this is the first time I've been out of the hospital system while a mother's giving birth, even though I feel felt, you know, I, I can do those things with women or I can be beside women. But my midwife colleague was very relaxed. It was all happening beautifully. The mother was giving birth to her baby and taking her baby and it seemed to me like this baby didn't breathe or wasn't going to breathe and I got the little sucker ready and anyway I could just see the eyes watching me it's saying it's all right <laughs> the minute this little baby boy took his breath first breath <laughs> the dogs outside the bedroom window started howling two dogs they started howling you have no idea and and even now when I tell the story I'm tingling then the dogs in the neighbourhood started howling. All around there were dogs howling in the, in the houses, you know, along the street and around. Long way awake, we could hear them too. And then her mum said that the cats on the front doorstep were, were meowing as well. So the message went out like it was phenomenal. So that's what encouraged me to in another <laughs> home birth and another home birth because I had so many encounters with people's animals and they were phenomenal. Wow. The That's little kids, beautiful. the children were, were brilliant. So that first, uh, and just recently that mother contacted us because she's going to be a grandma now. <laughs> so I hadn't heard from her for, well, you know, the kids have all grown up, they're all adults. Oh, yeah, so wow. she made contact with us, event. which was lovely. I got such a surprise. <laughs> but I have had a contact now from a lot of the, either the children or the parents. So about goosebumps when you told that story. That is such a touching story. I'm so glad you shared it with us. Oh. So the animals of the community Chelsea, welcomed there's, there's this little more. baby in the world. Chelsea, there's plenty more. There's the koala bears. There's the mare, the mother's mare. There's the, the python snakes. There's oh. the rabbits. There's the frill neck lizard. <laughs> There's the cats. <laughs> and, you know, it's absolutely amazing <laughs> when you see how the interaction is when you've not been used to that before. It's, it's not that they're there in the birth space. It's they're around out there yeah. in the birth space, beyond the birth space. But, you know, there are so many stories to tell. Then that, That's not just all. There are other stories too. But I do have now more of the babies that were born at home I've had contact with. They've contacted me for different reasons or, or the parents or the mothers. You know, it's really beautiful to look back on it and think, oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, of your grandson's birth is that right at home? That's right. Yes. Well, yes. I flew to Japan for the eldest one. Wonderful. And the youngest one was born in Melbourne, and his Japanese grandma came over for the birth, and his Japanese auntie. So yeah, I was privileged, so privileged. And the the Japanese Midwives Association made it so easy for me to be able to fulfil that journey with with my family um they they actually didn't ask me to register they checked me out we had a long conversation and then they wrote the story in their journal later 
So, yeah, I was very, very privileged. Mm. That's much more um, relaxed to some policies around the world. I know that much. I'm not sure whether it's still like that, but it's. It was, I'm sorry uh, that for the viewers that we're having a bit of delay here. I think it's because we have um, we've been online for a while now, so maybe our, our computers are getting a bit sleepy. <laughs> But thank you for sharing that, Robin, if you can hear me. And um, we've got lots more questions coming in, lots more experiences being shared, which is wonderful. I'm sure we'll all enjoy reading those for the rest of the day. Keep them coming. Are you considering a home birth? Let us know. We hope you found this useful. Of course, Dr. Robin does um, speak about this in a lot more in depth in the club, in the program. So let us know if you want more. And like I said, if you'd like that bonus video call, that pre birth video call with Dr. Robin herself and midwife Rachel, then comment hashtag baby bump below and we will send you the details. So, Dr. Robin, it's been an honor again. Can I just acknowledge some of the, my, just acknowledge of course, some of my ahead. colleagues over the many years who have been. You know, we we have been a unique group of midwives, I would say. Some obstetricians, some GPs, and I want to thank them because they know who they are. And, you know, some amazing midwives that have travelled to the other side of the world to help women as well, who set up birth centres and done things as well. So it, it's really something that we definitely need to consider and reconsider and, and rethink. We need to be able to provide women with what they want, not what we want them to do. Thank you, Chelsea. <laughs> No, thank you. I think from behalf of all women worldwide, thank you for being in our corner and for fighting for these rights because throughout your, your career, Dr. Robin, you have made not just ripples, but waves. Yeah. You've made <laughs> waves of difference. So um, we're very grateful for that. And hopefully um, this movement will change things. It will continue to make change as you spread that education worldwide. Mm -hmm. I know I am definitely educated and I will pass on education as will the rest of our members and that's what it's about that's the community yes. and birthing on country is also very very important too we do not let that go whatever we do <laughs>